Hope everybody's doing well. Welcome to the All Things Performance Podcast. I'm joined with my co-host, Derek Devine. As always, Derek, how you doing, man? Hey, hey. Let's what's go. up, what's up? Let's go, man. Hey, hey Derek, it looks like you're about to get some, some uh, spot treatment here in a minute, man. What's going on back Man, there? I got some feng shui kicking off over here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. And we are joined with a very uh, special guest, a good friend of mine, family friend, known uh, Dr. Ben McKinday uh, since we were kids. Uh, Dr. Ben McKinday uh, has a practice that focuses on family medicine and sports medicine in the great Northwest, and we are we are blessed to have him here today, man. Ben, how are we doing today, man? We're good, man. I'm feeling how, good. How, how's that? How's that weather? How's that weather up there, man? It, you know, it's one of uh, this year. I actually uh, I don't do resolutions, but <clears throat> I told myself I wasn't going to complain about the weather anymore. So good good the weather you. is great because if you get, you know, if you're, if you're able to experience the weather, that means you're, you're alive or you're not in the hospital. So that's right. That's you know, right. No, the weather is, the weather is what it is. I'm not complaining, man. That's good, man. That's good. I, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm excited about this podcast for a couple of different reasons. Two years ago, the world as we knew it went underneath uh, or went under rather uh, something that it has never seen before. COVID-19, right? Um, obviously, there have been plagues, there have been pandemics, uh, there have been mass spreads of illness, sickness, and disease, but nothing like this in recent history. And we actually had you on for a podcast back then, and it was interesting just listening to some of the things that you said, um, almost in a, it was like, it was like, prophetic, you know what I'm saying? Like some of the things that you said that were going to happen, the things that must happen. And now we're prayerfully, right? Prayerfully, we're on the uh, the tail end of this thing and, and things are getting better. The morbidity has gone down. There are now vaccines, multiple vaccines. What are just some of your thoughts in general um, in relation to what, what you talked about back then and where things are now as a medical doctor? Well, I mean, at, at this point for me, and, you know, I deal with a lot of the... Um, issues with COVID and the pandemic in the skilled nursing facilities that I, that I work in. So I do that sort of as a side gig. I'm the medical director um, at a skilled nursing facility. Then I have a couple of nurse practitioners that see patients at a couple of facilities. And these are all, you know, geriatric senior citizen, older patients. They usually have a lot of health issues um, and they're essentially living in you know, an institution for lack of a better term. So this was when the pandemic first hit, it was, it just ravaged that environment. Um, we had, I haven't looked at the total number of patients that I, that we had that passed away, but it was, I, I signed more death certificates in that first year than my whole career. It was, oh. it was terrible. Just, it went from an environment that was somewhat enjoyable to be in to just very depressing. Every day you're putting on all the gear, patients are dying. The hospital can't take them anymore, so they're essentially dying there. Um, and then you got on top of that, staff getting sick, and then a lot of staff, um, nursing, nursing assistants, administrators, essentially just were like, you know what, this isn't for me. And so yeah. the, the buildings are understaffed. The people that stayed were overworked. Um, it, it, was, it was just a tough time. I mean, that was pretty much everyone I know in healthcare would have moments of just questioning, like, you know, is this what, really what I want to do? How long will this last? Um, and so then when the vaccines came out, that was kind of a turning point as far as um, decreasing death, which was, I mean, that's a big deal. Yeah. And, then, um, you know, now with the different variants, you know, what I'm seeing is a, people aren't really getting as sick even if they do test positive. Um, and so that is sort of a, a, a great thing to see because it's not going away ever. It's, there's just going to be different variants after different variants. And, you know, if you look at it from, um, this is going back to my medical school days, when you look at viruses and, you know, any pathogen bacteria, the goal of that organism isn't to kill its host because if it kills the host, then the virus itself is done. Right. So what it wants to do is mutate to the point to where 
it can continue to replicate without destroying its host. And I think that's kind of where we're getting to now where different variants come up, people get infected, but you're seeing less hospitalizations. You're definitely seeing less, less death. Um, there's still people being hospitalized. There's still people dying, but the numbers are a lot, a lot less. And so life has definitely changed for everybody. Um, and I think, you know, that's something that, you know, people used to talk about, you know, when this is over or, you know, the new normal, essentially it's, it's a part of our existence now as human beings. And, and we just have to learn to, to coexist with it. Um, things like masks or no masks and mandates, those are all sort of become now societal questions um, that are based in healthcare, but really more in just how do people want to want to live and that, that'll be interesting to see how that plays out over the next couple of years. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, I mean, you said it, you said it, it's, it's a societal issue. It's a political issue. Derek, I know that, you know, you, you live uh, at the time you were in California, you were in NorCal and oh, yeah. so California was a little bit different than Florida, than Texas, than Arizona, than New York. You know what I'm saying? There were, there were, there was a lot of kickback. There was a lot of compliance. Then it was like, Hey, I'm fatigued. Now there was kickback, like, dude, we ain't wearing the mask. Talk to us a little bit about the, about how it was in California and your neck of the woods, man, during this pandemic. And then we're going to go hard pivot here. Well, you know, the, the toughest thing with all that too, is then you would have the huge, you know, political spin on it because that's when, you know, there was a change in office and all that stuff was moving around. So you had all of that turmoil in there as well. I mean, you know, everybody in California, uh, was always viewed as just bonkers, you know, and so it was, it was always a very hot button issue, you know, a topic that uh, people definitely had their opinions on, you know, nobody really sat in the middle, you know, um, I think that ben, some of the stuff that Ben's talking about, I think there's a lot of people that didn't experience anything like that, didn't see anything like that. Um, so it would have been nice, you know, I think everybody really felt like, well, what is the truth here? Like, what are the actual facts? Cause you right. had so much stuff that was swirling around, uh, of just numbers and then, well, the flu and all these things, it would have been nice to have just some factual, you know, things that, you know, Ben just kind of let on, or at least hearing certain people's, uh, you know, kind of real world issues where it's like, you know, not everybody's having that where they're going every single day to sign death certificates. So it's a, it's a different scenario all the way around, but I would say California was definitely a uh, different environment for COVID than other places. Yeah. I mean, even, I mean, Jim, I, I, again, I don't want to sit here, you know, too long, but I want to acknowledge this because of, you know, previous conversation that we had regarding this, but even within the doctors, the doctors were politicized. You know what I'm saying? You had doctors, that were more concerned about political affiliation and yeah. who is in office, dare I say, right, than actual facts. And it's really good, you know, there's, I think, I think that there is a balance, a healthy balance between, hey, you know what, here are the facts. This is what happens, just like you, you just laid out, you know, uh, a virus wants to do X, Y, and Z, A, B, C, and one, two, three. It doesn't care about whether you want to wear a mask. It doesn't care about whether you're red or blue, donkey or elephant. It doesn't care, you know what I'm saying? And so I think that, you know, this time, it, it really revealed a lot of things about people too, you know? Um, and so, Bim, I'll give you the last word on this, and then we're going to we're going to gently close this. And, you know, in, in, in all respect, there were a lot of people, man, that again, that passed away, that were affected, that their livelihoods were affected. And I don't think that we can, uh, we'd be remiss if we, we didn't mention that. And it's something that definitely hit a lot of us. And I just pray to God that this thing is over and that, you know, I've been to, to, you know, to a prior conversation you and I had maybe hopefully the next time this happens, we're not even on this earth anymore. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, <laughs> but I'll give you the last word. I'll give you the last word and we'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll hop to something else here. Yeah. I mean, for, for my perspective, it's, you know, as a, as a physician, we interact one-on-one -on -one with individuals and with families. And that's where a lot of, our, we, you kind of touched on it earlier. That's where a lot of our, um, where we do, what we do sort of impacts people is that individual one-on-one -on -one level. And I think sometimes the, the media or the general public or the zeitgeist um, 
doesn't really make that distinction with the difference between public health and then your one-on-one -on -one relationship with, with your doctor. Um, the decisions, and this is why a pandemic or COVID or anything like that tests a society is because what you're asking people to do is not necessarily make decisions for themselves. You're asking people to buy into the community and society that, that you're in and make decisions based on what that means for that whole group. And in a, in a society or a, or a country like the United States where individual freedom is sort of paramount, those two things aren't always in line with each other. Right. And what essentially, if you think about in our personal lives, a lot of times the things we get tested on are the things that we need to get tested on, the things that are might be our biggest weakness. And um, if you look out, you know, just through history and even like biblical things and some of the stories you hear through the different ages, a lot of times the societies that ended up having issues, it wasn't because they were tested in the things they were good at. You know, it wasn't that some army came and destroyed, you know, some of these empires. It was other things, whether it was a disease or a natural disaster that they weren't prepared for. And I think that was one of the things that I took away from this was like, this was really a test of the um, sort of American or United States ethos of individual freedom, where if we allowed everyone to just do whatever they wanted, it made things worse. Um, and when you look back at the, I always kind of, I started reading about the the pandemic in 1918 with with the flu. It was really the same thing, a yeah. lot of the same stuff. And, and I think that was with social media and how everyone has a voice and is interconnected, you know, my take on it is that it's really impossible. And, and, and that might be a sort of a pessimistic way of looking at What's getting, getting everyone to buy into making decisions for society as a whole, as opposed gotcha. to what's good for me gotcha. and my individual family unit. I think it's impossible. Um, I just do. Yeah. And it's from just my interactions with people. Um, and my approach is just to try to, with each individual I meet, is understand what their values are and then help them weigh those, those sides. And then once they understand that, then they can make a decision that they feel comfortable with. And if they actually make it based off of that understanding, then to me, I can't, I have no problem with that. Yeah. So you no, know, it's like, you know what? I buy into this part of the society, this other parts I don't buy into. I understand what it means. And this is what I'm gonna do. I can't be upset with that. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that. I mean, I think that's a perfect, that's a perfect, you know, segue in a perfect way to to uh, end that conversation because man, that, that's one thing. What you just said, I hope that people hear what you just said. It's impossible to please everybody. Absolutely impossible. But guess what? You want to wear a mask? Great. Like I still, we're still, can we still be friends? Are we still friends? You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, you, you don't, you don't want to wear a mask. Oh, okay. Like wh whatever the case may be, you know, uh, you, you support the guy in the white house or the, or the, or the people in the white house, the, 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 the delegations that are pushing for X, Y, Z. That's great. I don't, can we still be friends? And so I think that, uh, it's one of those things where I think you hit it on the head, man, like do your research, have your information handy, make the decision that's right for you and yours. And man, let's just keep on moving forward and hopefully everybody's healthy, happy. Uh, and we never see something like this again. You know, I, I will say one thing that <laughs> made me laugh. Whenever I hear people say, do your research, I don't think they really understand what, what research is. Like not research, Google, not Google, research, bro. Not Dr. Research, Google. Research, research is like a career. Research takes a yeah. base level of understanding and then like going to understanding the sources and research isn't just get on your computer or get on your phone. And I think that's what a lot of people mean when they say do your research because that's like telling your son to drive himself to school when he's eight. Like, they can try, but it's not a good idea. They're not going to end up at school. Hey, point taken, point taken, that, that's real. You know, Not everyone is a researcher. That is hey, a career. Hey, hey, the first page of Google is not the answer. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I mean, not, hey, even Google Scholar, you know what I'm saying? Like, fact check, you know what I'm saying? So, hey man, hard pivot, hard pivot, here we go. Hey, so I want to get into, hey, so this is what I got, man. This is what I got. So, you know, 
we're 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 in the NBA finals. It's been a gr- I'm sorry, NBA playoffs. Now we're not at the finals yet. It's yeah. been a great playoff so far, right? Great playoffs. So I'm gonna name some names real quick and I'm gonna let it marinate and I wanna open this up, okay? Because this is this is this is like front and center right now, right? So Kawhi Leonard, Kyle Lowry, Adrian Peterson, Giannis. Anthony Davis, Zion Williamson, Ben Simmons. Hey, you hear these names, right? You hear these names. And some of these individuals, with the exception of two, are not contributing to their team. They're all-stars, superstars, many of them all pro first team. And many media prognosticators, critics are like, man, why are, why are, why are these cats not playing? Why are they not playing in the most critical situations and the critical moments? And then you have a couple of dudes on this list, Giannis, Adrian Peterson, right? Who get hurt, have these significant injuries and they're back in record time, like literally record time. So some people might say, oh yeah, man, they they have some, you know, they have some uh, some drugs, some medication to help them out. Mm -hmm. Some people might say, oh yeah, you know, uh, every injury is different. Some timetables are different. Every, you know, the predictor of future injury is past injury. So, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to get too far down a rabbit trail, but I want to segue this into mental health, physical health, readiness, mental toughness, mental sensitivity. As a doctor, as an MD, as somebody who works with athletes, being one yourself, what are some of your initial thoughts when you hear these names and others as it relates to why is this person not playing? Why is this person taking longer? Is this person ready? What's going on here? What are your thoughts, man? Well, the first thing for me uh, that I think about is, is how when an athlete suffers an injury, the biggest hurdle to return to the prior level of performance, which is something that is sort of studied, in my opinion, and I think there, is, um, there are studies that show this, uh, isn't the physical recovery it's it's the mental recovery it's it's that getting your confidence back right um, I think all three of us were athletes and I assume because of that we've all experienced injuries there's a certain moment that has to happen where you trust your body again and that takes time um, and not only does it take time it takes sort of getting out there and trying things and not feeling pain it takes doing things and your body responding the way that it did before the injury. Um, because you sort of have a rhythm as an athlete with your body where, okay, I do a training session or a workout or we have a practice and I know that night I'm going to feel a certain way. And I know if I do my recovery things the next morning, I'll feel a certain way. And my body sort of goes through this progression, you know, in the beginning of the season, you're more achy, more sore, different pains. You know, what is sort of a pain that your uh, body will adapt to as you warm up things get better and then you progress whereas when you have an injury it's sort of a complete stop of what you're doing and then everything is is new as far as okay they told me i'm cleared but you know my calf on this leg is smaller than the other one okay that's different in my mind i used to be able to do this you know i used to be able to touch the top of the square and now i'm you know i can barely touch the rim that's different. So now they say I'm clear, but my body doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel the same. Am I still hurt? Can I do this? I'm sore again, but is this the same way I was sore before after workout? So I think that mental hurdle because your body is different after an injury is a big thing, number one. Um, number two, I always sort of separate professional athletes from you know, college amateur athletes, because in the professional world, you're getting paid. Um, hey, well, hey, well, now, hey, well, now these college athletes, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's true. The NIL, college, the college, the college are getting paid, but it's not, you know, and I, and, you know, I appreciate that, but it's, they're, they're technically not getting paid for their performance. Um, they're getting paid because of the position that they're in. Right. Whereas in a professional setting, they're getting paid for their performance. And then in addition to getting paid for you know, the position they're in. And when you're getting paid for your performance um, and that's your job, there's a little different pressure. And so that might affect 
return to play decisions and when people get back out there and what's expected of them or not expected of them. And so my initial reaction is always with injuries, that's, that's one of the biggest things is in returning to your prior level of performance, regardless of what the injury is, there's always a mental hurdle that is really the last thing to, to go over because during your rehab, you're focused on your rehab. They, okay, this is what you do. Monday, it's what you do. Tuesday, it's what you do Wednesday. And you go through your rehab. And then at some point, they say, all right, go play. And you're going right back to the area where you suffered a traumatic experience. Yep. That does something to your mind. And you have reminders when you look at yourself and the way you feel when you do things. Yep. So in order to overcome those things, um, it can be difficult. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is, the, you know, this is a great point. I'm going to chime in here. But Derek, I know that obviously... Um, you, you played college football, you, uh, you're, you played in the NFL, you're around players who, um, it, you know, you, you, we all had those teammates, right, that it was like, oh, yeah. you, you, like, you always hurt, bro. Like, what do you, like, you like being hurt. You know what I'm saying? Like, what yeah. the heck, you know what I'm saying? And they're doing all the drills, practicing in practice. Like, well, you can't, you can't play? Like, what's going on? You know what I'm saying? And, yeah. then, you, and then we had those dudes that you look on tape and like, oh, you know what I'm saying? And they're right back up playing the next day. Or, or the next yeah. snap or the next, you know what I'm saying? After the next timeout, like, it's crazy. I want you to speak yeah. to that in terms of what has been some of your experiences real quick. And, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll touch on the mental piece as well. Go ahead, Derek. Well, I mean, no, every, every team, you know, it has that had that guy that was just kind of like a training room guy. He was always in there. And it was really weird. You would have just some, some of them, you know, I, I play with guys that just seem like, you know, been in the league 15 years. Just the most durable, like you would have never believed it. Yeah. most durable people ever and then there's guys that have been in the league two years and just absurd concussions you know three knees you know constantly put on ir all this stuff but the the one thing that was constant with all of them was was the mental just how you talk to them you know they'd be like oh man i feel great but you just oh man it's just there's a little th you know little things here and there like you would even hear hear them talk about how physically they felt so good but then it was just man but i'm, I'm constantly questioning this cut or this route or, you know, this, uh, this element of my game, you know, I, this one just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel smooth yet. And so, uh, man, I, I'd agree wholeheartedly with what, what Bim's talking about because it, it really was the mental side of it. They would physically be back or they'd be even physically stronger than they were before the injury. You know, their, yeah. their lifts would go up, all, all of their physical attributes would have, would have increased, but there's just something that's mental for them. That was so hard to get over, you know, uh, because at times some of the most gifted physical athletes were the ones that were hurt all the time. Yep. And so all of the stuff that they were doing in the weight room or, you know, speed and agility and all that stuff, it didn't correlate to them because even though they were at such a high level in those areas, it obviously wasn't enough to keep me injury free. So, well, you know, it's almost like they're looking for something that's missing. Yeah. What do I got to do to stay healthy? You know, and so no, I, I I would agree wholeheartedly with the fact that it is mental for sure. Yeah, it's it's um, I mean, you you both bring up some some good points. Um, and you know, one of the things like the human brain, the human brain has two primary functions. Number one, it wants to pre protect, wants to protect you. Number two, it's it's trying to predict what's happening next, what's going to happen next. And yeah. anytime there is an injury, anytime there is because an injury is a form of trauma. So anytime there is trauma, the, the brain says, you know what? Huh, don't remember that one. Huh, don't like how that felt. You know what I'm saying? And it, yeah. will, it will protect you anytime it sniffs anything that looks, smells, feels, reminds you of that injury. And like Bim said, you have, there are reminders all around you. And so one of the things that you have to do when an, when an athlete is injured is to, and you have to do this in a healthy manner, is to gently go back to that place, reenact those experiences so that the brain says, you know what, this is not bad. Like, I feel actually feel good. I've worked with players who the, the traumatic injuries, right, have happened at a specific place. And that, you know what I tell them? You need to go back to that place. You literally need to go back to that place. And it yeah. will start to, it'll start to break up and start to normalize what is happening. This is, this is a, I'm giving you here, some people might say this is an old wives tale, um, a legend, uh, whatever, fable, whatever you want to call it. But I think that there's something to be said for this. So in, in the Eastern Bloc in Europe, 
some of what some uh, what some uh, performance experts and coaches would do was anytime that there was a lower body injury and you had rehab to a certain point, they would make you stand on you know a table with a four or five foot drop, and they would tell you to jump off of it. And if there was any inhibition at all from the athlete to say nah nah, they knew that mentally the athlete was not ready, and they would the whole point was not never to jump off. It was never to have them jump off. It was just to see, to check where you are. And so, yeah. you know, with, with Ben's point, uh, with Dr. McKinday's point, I think, I think people need to understand, especially coaches, athletic trainers, doctors, those who are working with athletes, that there is, a, even though the healthy rehabilitation portion is huge, because that's another thing, Ben, that I'd like for you to touch on is the rehabilitation portion. There are many athletes who dread rehab. They hate rehab. They think that it's punishment. They're like, oh, but actually it's one of the most important things that you can do mentally for a physical readiness. So I'm going to stop there and Ben, I'm going to give it back to you. Yeah. I mean, I think um, part of the reason I think a lot of athletes hate rehab is because it is, um, it's like starting over every time you have to go through it. I don't think it's the rehab itself because if, you know, a lot of what rehab is, is like what you would do in your off season anyway. And most great athletes in the off season, they, they go to work. Um, the issue I think is in rehab, your body's not responding the way it does when you're training. Even though you're doing yeah. training like things, your body's not responding the same way. So it's frustrating. Um, and I think that's the reason um, there's the line between rehab and training these days, especially if you're towards the end of your rehab, there isn't much of a difference. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think what it, the, the reason most people or people who don't like it, don't like it is because of the circumstances around it. If you're rehabbing, that means you got injured and that means your body's not what doing what it was able to do. And you're trying to get back to that. And so it's a setback on your athletic, athletic journey. I remember every time I got hurt, I was extremely upset yes. every time I got hurt because I knew what that meant. And that I think is, you know, probably the main reason because it's just your body is not yours anymore. I used to be able to, if I was on my program, you know, at the beginning of the summer, you know, my vertical jump was 32. I do my thing by the end of summer, it's 38. When you're in rehab, it's, you're starting at, you can't even stand. And then now you're trying to walk without a limp and then you're trying to jog without pain. Then you're trying to run. I think that's the part of it that can be frustrating is because of the context. Yeah. And, and a lot of that again, is it stems from mental. Oh, I can't do this anymore. I used mm -hmm. to be able to do this. Yeah. I've lost my power. And, and Derek and I uh, had a podcast uh, uh, a while back called performance and identity. And this is where you get, uh, there, it's, it's actually very sad to tell you the truth because, you know, uh, both of all three of us on here are, are men of faith. We love the Lord. You know what I'm saying? We try our, our best to lead our families in, in, in the right way. And many people, unfortunately, athletes, unfortunately, their identity is their sport. That's what their identity is. And so when you take that away, you can't jump anymore. You can't run anymore. You can't throw anymore. You're, it's going to take you nine months. It's going to take you 12 to 14 months before you can be your identity again. And that yeah. hurts, man. That hurts. Derek, what are some of your thoughts about that in terms of not only from a mental standpoint, but almost like a spiritual and a soul level? Like I, this has been taken away from me and now I have to reset. Well, yeah, I do. I think, well, that then you get into the real foundational issue, man. I mean, that's when you find out. I mean, I know for me, man, when I got done playing, there was a huge adjustment to, well, what do I do now? Like there is no, I mean, forget 12, 14 months. It's like, no, we're done now. So what do we, who, who are we? Who am I? Where do I go from here? I, you know, you're talking about a huge issue. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, that's, that's your, that's your whole, you know, it was weird. Like how much you would think this would take up your whole life. I was talking to a friend the other day about this, where it's like, that's athletics is such a short period of life. Like 
now you have the rest of your life, the majority of your life, you know, to live now, what do you even do with it? And I think there's a lot of guys out there that really don't have an answer. Yeah. You know? And so, I mean, just even injuries, I don't think anybody preps for a, okay, well, there's probably a chance I'll tear my ACL and I'll have this and then I might rupture an Achilles and I'll have that. But other than that, we can figure those things out. Nobody's thinking that. Everybody no. thinks we're going to be healthy. Everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be easy. You know, I even had guys that would have consistent knee scopes where it was quick, you know, Oh, it's just going to be three, four weeks, you scope it. You'll be good. And they were there, but no, man, it's, it's, it's way more than that because yeah. then you have the recovery, then you have everything. So, man, I think it's a huge issue for sure. Yeah. yeah. Bim, what are some, this is good stuff, man. So let, let's go hard pivot. Let's go hard pivot, like looking to the future, right? Um, you're working with athletes. You're, you're, you're in medicine. Uh, oftentimes medicine and athletics um, are act as the harbingers and give us foresight just to, you know, just to society in general in terms of what to expect um, and how we treat our athletes, the, the, the type of, you know, medication treatment um, and things that we them to perform at high levels. What are some things that you're seeing right now in the world of medicine or some practices from some elite level athletes that you think are going to be game changers in the future, or this is kind of where sports medicine is heading? Yeah, in, in, in sports medicine and, and really performance, there's a, there's a couple of things that have sort of been percolating over the last few years. I would say one of the big ones is um, personalized treatments. So looking to use your own uh, body, your own immune system, your own cells, your own body's ability to heal, to try and stimulate that in specific areas, whether it's, um, you know, right now, if you were get an ACL surgery, you would, you know, back in the day, you would get one from either a cadaver, um, but then, or they would use your own patella or they would use your hamstring. You know, now we're looking to see if we can regrow your, you know, people's own tissues to use your own cartilage, regrow your own ACL, you know, things like wow. TV, where we're using your own, you know, your platelets to try to get the body to heal stem cells, those types of things. And it's, it's sort of early, but I think if you were to look like future, future, I, I think that's where um, a lot of, of medicine is going, not just sports medicine. Um, and it's kind of funny. This is something we talked about, I think, a couple of years ago when we talked about, you know, vaccines and, and um, you know, I gave a talk about vaccines, uh, maybe about a year into the pandemic. And, you know, if you look at like cancer treatment, for example, mm -hmm. there, the promising research is, is, is using your immune system to, to treat, treat cancers. Every person that lives throughout your life, your immune system will actually kill off hundreds of cancer cells that you would never even know about. Um, wow. and so, and whether it's sports medicine or oncology or treating heart disease, treating kidney disease, um, I think a lot of the answers are going to be in trying to figure out how to stimulate the body to do what it's already doing, but is in some people sort of missing certain things that are slipping mm -hmm. through the cracks. And so that, that to me is a big one is not sort of relying on, you know, pharmaceuticals that are produced, but in trying to tap into each and each individual's um, body's own capacity um, to heal uh, and using that to treat illnesses, using that to help tissues regenerate. Um, another big one in sports medicine uh, that's kind of been, been coming out lately is uh, blood flow restriction therapy, which is something now that I think even in health and wellness is people are trying to train with that. But essentially allowing people to put their uh, muscles, tendons, ligaments under increased stress loads without using a lot of resistance or weight. And so sort of putting your body in a position where those cells are stimulated as if they were so you avoid the trauma of squatting 600 pounds, but your muscles feel as if they're doing that. And so that's been used in a lot of people who are coming back from things like Achilles tears and, and uh, ACL ruptures faster. Um, those are probably two of the big ones that come to mind of looking down the road. Wow. How are they, put, how are they putting them under that tension? So uh, essentially the, the principle is if you, you know, if, so if you if you go and you, you know, do a leg workout and you're squatting or 
uh, and yeah. then you do some lunges and leg press. What's happening is you're you're putting those muscles under tension. They need more blood. Those products coming in builds up metabolites, which essentially you reach a point where the muscle is not getting enough oxygen. You fatigue, you stop, and then you let it recover. Mm-hmm. But in order to get to that point, you have to stress everything. Um, and so if you can put the muscle in that position without stressing it, you're able to essentially simulate going through that intense workout without your muscles actually dealing with the stress of that workout. So if you just restrict blood flow, you're already starting off. It's like an analogy I would use is someone who trains in high altitude or someone who trains with one of those masks that, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, like a Bane mask where you're trying to stimulate your body to essentially produce more oxygen carrying capacity without, you know, going and running 50 okay. miles every day. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. That, that's, that's the theory behind it. Um, which is without getting off track. It's funny when people talk about not being able to work out with masks and like, it might actually help you, but you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's the, 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 the principle behind it is, is by restricting blood flow, you're putting the muscle at a disadvantage. And so now you can train as if you were healthy that's the way your muscles think because they're under that stress, but because you're rehabbing, you're not going to put 500 pounds on the leg press because you would make your injury worse. But now yeah. you can put 25 pounds on it and sort of simulate at a molecular level, what your muscles are going through. Yeah. That's, I mean, obviously needs to be under doctor's care supervision Cause this, that yeah, there's, there's some people, yeah, there's some people that are, are like everything in sort of health and wellness, you can do things under doctor care and you can also do them under, you know, <laughs> Ivan, uncle. Ivan, yeah. your trainer. Yeah. You're, 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 yeah, yeah. Your uncle, they got a gym. Yeah. yeah, the, yeah got, you got a CrossFit box. Hey man, I'm not, yeah. I'm not even on CrossFit. You know what I'm saying? But, but yeah, yeah, man, there's, that, yeah, that's can, no, for sure. For sure, because I mean, you start getting into stuff like, you know, bone mineral density, yeah. and, and and you know, there there are things that aren't happening when you're when you're doing that type of exercise, and then obviously there are people that would manipulate that for their own gain, and it can get hairy. But absolutely, I could definitely see that um, under the right care being something that is very beneficial for athletes. So this is good stuff, man. So let let's go let's go hard pivot because. The parents these days are ruthless. They're more ruthless than they've ever been, right? You know, many parents look at their little kids. I mean, obviously we have kids and we were all athletes and we want to see our kids do well. Like we want to see our kids do well. You don't want to, you don't want your kid, you know what I'm saying? Like, like being a scrub. You want your kid to do well, right? And so unfortunately the extreme of that is many kids, they look, or many parents rather look at their children as meal tickets. They look at their children as investments. And if their kid's not playing well, then it's just like, ah. Oh. And in, in so doing, there are things that parents are starting to have their kids do that you and I, all of us on this call, we never did. We just went out and we just played ball. You know what I'm saying? We just played ball. And so, uh, Bim, talk to us about specialization. Talk to us about overuse. You know, should a kid be having... Uh, uh, elbow surgery at 12 years old on a travel club team. You know what I'm saying? Um, should kids be pulling hamstrings? You know what I'm saying? Like, like talk to us about taking care of our little ones, man, and, and setting, them up, setting them up for success, man, down the road, um, if they so choose to pursue athletics. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is something I, I deal with every day um, in practice. And then also just you know, as a father and a coach, I coach my kids in basketball. And, um, you know, the first thing that, that I think about when, um, I look at, thank you. Sorry. My assistant just came in. Um, the first thing I look at when I think about youth sports is, is, um, I don't think kids should specialize until they get to high school. That's just me. Some people would say, different maybe, but that to me, it doesn't make sense Um, because there isn't a sport in the world where as you're developing and growing, you wouldn't be helped in that sport by doing another sport. 
right? That, that just doesn't exist. I don't care what your primary sport is. There is no sport where as you're developing as an athlete, you wouldn't be improved in that sport that's your number one sport by doing another sport. The benefits are just, I mean, we don't even have to get into it. It just doesn't make sense to me for anyone that is before high school to only play one sport or do one sort of activity that requires their body to move. That's, that's number one. Number two, um, you know, a lot of development in sports now has, you know, depending on what your socioeconomic background is, a lot of kids will have a, either a trainer or some sort of specialty coach that they work with outside of their team. Um, and I, I think those things are good, but in my opinion, it should not be at the expense of trying another sport. Like I see kids now in elementary school, like working out the way I do. And I'm like, what are you doing that for? Like you have so much time to, you know, do shuttle sprints and, and cardio things as opposed to like just playing and working on your reaction and, and your skills and, and just your motor control, you know, with, in a, in a playing format as opposed yeah. to someone with a whistle saying, all right, we got one minute of high knees and that kind of stuff doesn't make sense to me for, for elementary school age kids, because as we all know, there's going to be plenty of training. Yeah. <laughs> there's you're, you're going to, they'll get, I think they're just going to get sick of it and burnt out, especially when they do all that training and then they get in, get injured and then go through that cycle. Uh, and so for new sports, to me, the biggest thing is I think all kids should do multiple sports. Um, and I think they should um, limit the length of the training sessions. That's one thing I started doing this past year. Um, because, you know, now for me, if, when I work out after about an hour, after in 15 minutes, I'm like, all right, this is enough for kids with the, with their way, their bodies are developing in their attention span. It doesn't make sense for me, for a, a 10 year old or 11 year old to be doing anything for longer than an hour. Uh, yeah. even that is like by towards the end, I don't know how old Derek's kids are, but to just keep their attention, you know, so that they're actually getting something out of it longer than that, you know, is very difficult to do. And so when you add on that the risk of injury is higher, if you specialize in just one sport at an early age, when the risk of burnout is higher, when you specialize in just one sport at an early age, um, to me, I think it's more because of the parents' anxiety about their kids not reaching their potential yes. than opposed to like making uh, decisions that are in the best interest of the, of the youth, youth athlete is why that's happening because if you want if you look at the greatest athletes in any sport i would say the majority of them did not just play that sport growing up they did other things and then at some point it was like oh yeah you're the, you're you have potential you're the real deal now we're spending more time but that didn't happen in elementary school exactly <laughs> i think that's well said i think that's well said i got something to say but derek who like you had something to say man go ahead well, I, he was just talking about attention spans and stuff like that. And I remember we'd just be in college practicing for three hours and I'm wondering myself, what are we even doing here? Yeah. I mean, and it's like, and you're, I mean, you're talking 21, 22 years old. And I just started, you know, it just over my, over just my time of working out for 20 plus years, you start realizing then, you know what I can get done in 45 minutes. Yeah. I can get a lot done in 40, you know, and so you just start thinking, you know, why are these kids practicing four or five times a week when they're eight years old for football? Like it's, it's just, it's, it's mind blowing to me. I mean, and so, I mean, even there was a story uh, with the uh, Ravens head coach. It was just talking about, man, we had way too many injuries this past season. Something's wrong with our practices. We got to shorten this up, figure this out and make this, make this something that is, uh, that is more efficient. So it's like, you got that even at the, at the highest the pro level. of levels, you know, and I just don't think that's trickling down. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think, Derek, if you bring up a good point, and Dan, back to your, back to your point in, in regards to kids and attention spans, and Derek, your point with the pro athletes, when you start talking about sports, especially with, with, with kids, they have to be having fun, right? Yes. And great coaches, great coaches understand what they need to do in order to elicit the, the, the said skill during that time frame and make it fun. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like we can work on, yeah. we can work on technique. We can, uh, to Bim's point, we can work on motor learning. We can work on balance control. We can work on arm angle. We can work on all kinds of things 
while still making it fun and not robotic and like, oh, we are. the worst is when you have practices that are set up just to kill time. It's just like, yeah. you can actually get all of this done in 30 minutes and then let, Easy. The, and let the kids just play for the rest yeah. of the time. Like, that's how it should be. It shouldn't be, all right, you know, you know period 35, here we go. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, nah, yeah. man, like let, them, let them play, you know, high levels, high, uh, high um, short, intense bouts of focus, right? And then let them play. Move so, it. yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, you know, I think you all bring up some great points. Um, Bim, what, you know, as it relates to sports, as it relates to medicine, you know, this is a broad question that I'm going to ask you, but what's broken right now? And how should we fix it, right? Um, when it comes to our athletes in, you know, the NBA, the NFL, the Major League Baseball, hockey, you know, when it comes to the professional level, when it comes to the collegiate level and the hard pivot that's happening now at the collegiate level. I mean, we got transfer portal. Somebody was joking the other day, man, they're like, man, we need to make a coach's portal. I'm like, man, they, <laughs> already, like, got, they already got that. Exactly. They can do whatever they, they want anytime they want. Yeah. You know, obviously we're talking about, you know, youth sports right now. And I just want you real quick as we get ready to close, Bim, um, just talk to us about what's broken right now in the world of sports. And how, how should we fix it? Well, I mean, that, that, that is a broad question. And I think there's different answers depending on what, um, what AIDS group and what level versus, you know, professional versus amateur that you're talking about. In youth sports, um, and I can kind of just speak to what's, you know, I see in our neck of the woods in the Seattle area. Um, and I think it's probably the same in, in, in other parts of the country is, there is there are a lot less programs available that don't require you to be at a certain financial level to participate um, when it comes to youth sports. I think a lot of the separation happens because of financial ability as opposed to potential mm -hmm. and, and sort of just the general access. Um, a lot of areas, you know, after school sports, and this was even, you know, intensified with COVID, got cut, seasons were cut, some of the opportunities for, for kids and families that don't have as many resources, those things, the funding that was there for them have just gone away. And so the only kids, I remember during the pandemic, the only kids that were doing sports were the ones that were on select teams that were traveling. Yeah. Um, and and so there was a whole one to two years where kids that would normally rely on, you know, the community centers, the boys and girls clubs, the sort of programs that didn't have as high of a cost, they just didn't have anything. Um, yeah. And so, you know, even when I was growing up, if you were someone that had a lot of ability, you would play on teams because they would like he's good. So we'll waive the fee or someone will sponsor. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Things like that are happening are happening less and less because kids are again selecting out so early and a lot of what that has to do with in the beginning isn't because i always i joke around but i'm really serious when i say it you know when i look at eight nine ten year olds and i'm coaching them none of them are good they're all terrible because if you were to put me against them in the same sport like just i don't care because of age or size like they're they're not good yet it takes years yeah. to get good at something yeah. A lot of times I think the adults mistake potential or a early developer for actually being good. <laughs> so, when, when you, when you have that, it's okay. There are certain kids that, that develop earlier. They have better coordination earlier. They're, or they have older brothers, you know, things like that, but that doesn't mean they're good. And that doesn't mean the other kids can't be good. Exactly. So in yeah. the beginning, it really should be about like exposing them to as many different types of sports and activities as possible to seeing what they're naturally might have a better aptitude for. And in my opinion, that's actually what leads kids to want to do it. It's like, oh, wow. Like every time we run, I'm always first. And so people say, oh, you're fast. And so they want to run more. Yeah. Or, you know, a kid is just naturally strong. And so every time kids are playing flag football, 
They're just a beast out there. They're not training for that. But the only way you know that is if they're, they have the opportunity to do it. Whereas opposed to now, it's A, the kids will start as soon as, I mean, there's five, six-year-old select teams now. And now you're this position and the coach puts you here and they're looking to see, well, that's, that's my position. And they don't really even know the game or the sport. They just know the position they've been put into. And then they start training. And then by the time they're, they're 17, they have a little, their first bout of adversity and the other kids start to, to catch up and they say, you know what, I'm done. And yeah. to me, that's where a lot of yeah. issues I think with youth sports lie is that there's barriers to access for a lot of kids and B, these kids that are playing are put in positions where they're not actually learning how to be athletic. They're learning a specific position in a specific team. And as soon as that is no longer just given to them, they don't know what to do. Yeah, uh, great point. That's a great point. I mean, we've all had that, that kid, you know what I'm saying? When we were in the fourth grade or fifth grade that had a full blown mustache and you're like, oh man, he's, yeah. he's probably good. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I think, I think the point, the point that you make is huge being like, just because a kid is an early developer doesn't mean that he's good. You know, nah, they're not, they're never good because they're kids. Yeah, right. exactly. There, there are countless, countless people, players in the NFL right now that didn't start playing ball until high school. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They didn't start playing tackle football until, until high school. And yeah. they're, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it, difference makers for their team. Yeah. And like you said, it takes years to be good. It takes years to, to be great. And I think one of the sad things, I know, Ben, you have all boys. Um, Derek has uh, two daughters. I have two daughters uh, and two sons. It, and Derek, you have a, a little guy. It's even more, Ben, what you said applies even, I think, even more so to females than it does to males because they will self-select out earlier. I'm not, I don't want to misquote the, 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 the statistic, but they actually will self-select out and say, you know what, I'm done with sports at age 10 or lower because they weren't athletic enough or they missed a play or, you know, they, they didn't have time to develop. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that what you're saying is, is critical on, on the youth level. Well, what are some of your thoughts? I mean, we're all college athletes here. What are some of your thoughts, Bim, real quick um, on, you know, as far as the collegiate level, man, in terms of uh, what's broken there? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a NCAA question, <laughs> essentially. Um, you know, I, it depends on what you're, how you're looking at it. If you're looking at it from dollars coming in, I, I, I don't think it's broken. I think they're making, in total, it makes a lot of money. Um, if you're looking at it from the uh, college experience, from an athlete's perspective, I think it depends on where you go. I think if you're, you know, a football player at Alabama who is playing and has a few NIL deals, I think college is, is great. If you're a rower at, you know, Colgate, and I hope no one at Colgate is watching this or listening to it and offended, but shout out Colgate. Their, their, their budget is a lot smaller and yeah. you're doing it because you love to row and you would row anyway. And, you know, you get a scholarship or some financial aid assistance. You're, you're, you're there for that experience. Um, I think a lot of times what ends up happening, at least in the popular culture is we spend more time focusing on the people who are sort of in the middle where they're, they might have been recruited by a school like Alabama uh, and, or, you know, a big time program and they got there and their experience wasn't a continuation of their success in high school. And so now they're frustrated and they want to transfer. And in the past, the coach would be like, no, we're not letting you leave. Or if they did let him leave, they had to sit out a year. And so, yeah. you know, oh, that wow. experience, yeah, that experience is terrible for that athlete because in high school, they were the main, the main guy or gal, they get to college. Oh, this isn't the situation I thought it would be, or I'm homesick or all the things kids go through and I'm not having success and I want to make a change. The NCAA had set up a system where like making a change was just not, it was punishment to make that change. Um, but on the other hand, coaches were allowed to change if the situation wasn't right. Um, and, then, and then you add the component of, you know, they were trying to 
maintain amateurism and, and some of those issues. So then these young kids who are asked to make, uh, you know, the analogy I use is, is in medical school, you have to decide after your second year what specialty you're going to go into. And you don't really have any idea what the day-to-day of that means. Basically, you get a month with each specialty when, in your first two years. And then afterwards, you have to decide, oh, well, out of all those things I did, you know, what do I, what do I want to do? And that shapes the rest of your life off of one month. Once you start down at the path, it's very difficult to change it. You can do it, but it's like, it's very hard to do it. And so a lot of times you just end up like, I'm going to like what I do. You just find the parts about it that you like, and then that's what you do. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, for college athletes, if you end up in a situation where it wasn't what you thought it would be, or maybe your skills weren't at the level for you to actually have success there, um, and you want to leave, and previously it was sort of looked at as this was a problem on your end. Yeah. Not looking at it like this was a 17, 18 year old person who made a decision that they didn't have all the information about. I mean, think about what a recruiting visit entails. It's nothing like what your experience is going to be. If your college, something called sports was like social events, partying, and then, you know, a big game. I mean, you could go anywhere. Like, it doesn't matter. It's like, no matter where you go, that's the experience, but that's not the experience. The experience is, you know, you're dealing with other human beings, you're dealing with sometimes coaches that have your interest at heart, other times coaches where it's like, I'm on the last year of my deal, I need you guys to produce or, you know what I mean? And so now you're responsible for another person's livelihood, literally away from home. You know, it's, to me, it, it didn't, it didn't make sense, especially when you were part of a billion dollar industry. Um, You know, one of the things people talk about is like, should college athletes be paid? Should they not be paid? You know, is a scholarship um, getting paid? What's the value of a scholarship? I know a lot of people that graduated college in 2019, 2020, and that, that, that degree is worthless because of what's happening in the world. Um, And so those are things that like can and and will be debated. You know, the, my take on it was, I, I think, I think college athletes, if you're at a, at a university or an institution that's generating income, I, I think, your labor should be compensated. I think it shouldn't necessarily be you get a paycheck and uh, and a W-2 every year. I think that should be looked at as like uh, an, an escrow account or a 401k where each year you're there, you, you get paid, but you can't touch that until you graduate. And then if you leave early, then there's a penalty that you pay for, for leaving early. Just like if you tap into your 401k early, you don't get all that money you pay a heavy price for it. And so if someone stays all four years, there's an incentive for them to stay all four years. If they leave early, they still get something, but there's a penalty for, for leaving early. To me, that's the only way that makes sense. You're opening up a can right there. Whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa. You open up a can right there. That's, to me, that makes sense because I don't think someone who's generating you billions of dollars should be told, well, you have a scholarship. Like, you know, yeah. my degree in African American studies is how how much value does that have other than you know, I learned some things. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's interesting. Fine. Derek, Derek, Derek and I had Will Armijo on the podcast to start off the season, and we were talking about college athletes. And you're talking about a you know billion dollar industry that is just you know built, you know what I'm saying, on the 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 labor and the performances of these college athletes that it's ridiculous how much money the NCAA makes. And it's just one of those things, man. It just makes you, it makes you think, man. So um, Derek, what, uh, what are your thoughts, man, here as we get ready to close? No, oh, man, we could talk for hours on that last topic right there. <laughs> <laughs> I only have two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have two minutes. Yeah. yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I mean, uh, no, I agree. Whole, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, the NCAA is, uh, I still don't think is doing their job at all um and i mean what a great point you know like uh, because i took recruit visits too and it's absolutely nothing like what was your i mean really what should have happened is you should have got off the plane and you should have been getting cussed at by your coach (laughs) and hey we're going to four hours meetings and you know it should have been you know by the way go to class you know don't miss class yeah (laughs) yeah exactly oh and then after class check in we got meetings then you got training table (laughs) yeah the whole the whole deal but uh (laughs) 
no, man, I definitely think there is a, you know, that system is, is broken and, and they need to do something to fix that system for sure. You know? Yeah. It's, I mean, yeah. obviously you're talking to people who, who had to, who lived that life, man. So it's, it's crazy, man. You think it's getting better, but oof. anyhow, man, Ben, we would just want to say thank you for joining How's us. Today. Um, we just want to say thank you for joining us today. I mean, I think the, the points that you bring up were so valid and, and yeah. powerful. It's, it's good to be on this side of, you know, the chaos from two years ago um, when this whole thing ensued. But as we get ready to go today, um, what are some final thoughts that you have, man, just to, just to encourage everybody out there. And as we go about, um, you know, this end of spring, start of the summer, man, what are some, some final words of encouragement that you have uh, today? Um, I mean, I, I think everyone, there's a lot that's going on in the world, you know, pandemic, wars, all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, in my interactions with patients every day, you start to see kind of how we all sort of have the same things going on in our lives, just at different times. And so when you are interacting with people, um, always just try to think of, you know, we're all kind of going through the same stuff at different times and give yeah. each other that grace and you know, try to take care of each other. That's what I do every day. Amen. Amen. Well, man, thank you so much for joining us, for my co-host, Derek Devine, and for our guest today, uh, Dr. Ben McKinde. This is Josiah Egana with the All Things Performance Podcast. Hope you all have a tremendous rest of your day. Thank you. 